G'day ladies and gentlemen, Hugh Archibald here from Feedworks, joined as always by Ian Sawyer. Um, and we're here to do a summary of what was an absolutely brilliant webinar from Dr. Rodrigo Albornoz at AgVic down at Ellenbank. Um, Ian, he's actually moved the discussion forward to say, hey, transition doesn't stop at calving. There's so many farms that we go on to and we do it all the time. Is, Oh, what's your transition program? And it ends at the point of partrition. They say, the calf's out, my transition program is yeah. over. And it was fantastic. Two years of research and really well done, Rodrigo. Two years of research that just sort of said, hey, this is worthwhile investing in that first three weeks post-calving because the payback was 70 days and still going. That's just when he stopped recording. Yeah. Like 10 weeks of payback for three weeks of feeding. Yeah, you, there's nice. money in that somewhere. No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> nice carryover effects. Nice, nice responses to the, the starch mediation, nice responses to the metabolizable protein. And you're absolutely right, Hugh. I mean, you sit around and, and you think about how he's brought his area of study from North America, plonked it down in Australia and, and started turning out some really relevant results to our world here um, that follow on from his North American stuff. But the messages were so consistent, weren't they? As insofar as righto, if we change the way the rumen, the starch ferments in the rumen, look at the things we get. Hey, we get better dry matter intake, but that dry matter intakes of our homegrown forage. Yes. We graze more. That's pretty exciting from a profit point of view. If we think back to a lot of the DA messages of the last decade is, if we can op get more homegrown forage down the cow's neck, we're in front. So all of a sudden getting our supplements right is hitting one of those big ones, but it didn't stop there, did it? It went on a little bit further from that. Do you want to go there? Well, it's great. I mean, you start thinking about that. When you get that right, you, you slow down body condition score loss. When you slow body condition score loss, a wealth of data that shows from people like Paul Fricky, previous sort of uh, webinar, showing that there's fertility um, benefits around that. But we're also getting more milk. I mean, isn't that just the, the, the golden egg of more milk and better repro at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the really cool part about this is you looked at the first year study, the study you did in 2019, and I, th I think he was almost, Rodrigo was almost disappointed. But then that 2020 study came out and you realised how significant the 2019 yeah. study was because how many different ways can we say forage quality? Um, it just showed if you'd have crap forage to frip ca fresh cows, <laughs> And sorry for the language, folks, but that's what it is. If you've got crap quality forage in fresh cows, don't expect good things to happen. You need your best forage for those early lactation cows, don't you? To the surprise of nobody, 55 NDF silage didn't prove to be a particularly good fresh cow diet. And when they repeat the scenario and they, they bring in a 40 NDF you know, uh, forage, we go, huh, golly gee whiz, dry matter intake goes up, but it is further promoted by that mediation of the starch degradation. Absolutely. Um, further promoted. So if we look at that from a commercial point of view and say, hey, so where's some places that Feedworks might be able to help you out? It's, I look at Bioprotect, and this has been one of your babies for, oh, this could be one of those 15 year overnight successes yes. we like to talk about so often, but it's something that's been very, you've seen the opportunity, and, and now maybe this is the time to start talking about Bioprotect. Yeah, very much. Gosh, we, we have uh, been in that space with that a particular tool for a long while. I mean, obviously for a lot of people, corn remains the tool that we're going to uh, bring into diets to mediate starch degradation. And it doesn't have to be all corn or, or all wheat. We know we get responses from, from partial um, you know, in inclusion. Peas, um, with their slower degrading starch, also remain um, somewhat of a tool. But for a lot of people, um, Bioprotect and its capacity to take wheat or barley and turn it into sort of something that looks like 50% corn and 50% wheat. You know, thanks Frank Dunshay for those sort of um, nice bits of uh, um, in vitro um, analysis. Um, that's a tool that's gonna be quite useful and do things at a cost that's pretty similar to using the corn. Yeah, and I, and I think if we look at some of the new season's prices, which I think we're both starting to hear a little bit at the moment, yeah, might be 40, 50 bucks. Well, hey, yeah, there's still a place there for buy protect even when the numbers are that close. And the other important thing is, one of the things that Rodrigo mentioned was when you're dealing with corn is you've got to grind it as fine as you can get. You want your corn in flour. Now that's not necessarily practical for a lot of feed mills or for a lot of farms out there. And that's one of the things BioProtect, it can keep your particle size on your wheat up so you minimise dust and all of those challenges, but you still get the fermentation profile of that wheat corn mix that you were talking about. So it is actually a product that gives you some really, really neat options 
um, that you might not have heard about it before. So um, if you've got, if it's one of those ones that, hey, that sounds interesting, please give us a call. Yeah, do. It's something that we've been playing with for, I think, I think I first came across that product even before I came to Feedworks, which is 15 or 16 years ago. But corn remains a dead set option for people and we're not trying to turn anybody off corn. Just remember, get it fine. One of the things that stops a good marginal response to the inclusion of corn is if you leave it too coarse, your total tract digestibility is compromised. You end up crapping out corn, not getting total degradation across the tract, not getting glucose shields the way you want it. And people, you know, if you do that, you get disappointed with the result. Yeah. Now, one of the things I've loved as we've been doing these webinars, we're coming up to a year now, and one of the great things I think you and I both found is the, the, the synergies or the crossover of messages between yeah. different presenters. Paul Fricke's talk, I want to say, was September, October last year, and there's a lot of stuff that Paul talked about that Rodrigo's talk today helps us apply. And if I go back a long time in talks that we've done is our great mate Lou Armentano, who I mentioned, <laughs> we mentioned in the, um, in the Q&A there with Rodrigo at the end. Lou it was fantastic and taught us an enormous amount about metabolizable protein. And, and that was one of those things, if you're sort of thinking, Rodrigo's really picked up what Lou taught us and applied it very, very practically, hasn't he? Like some of these MP messages in our system, it is just about MP, metabolizable protein, isn't it? Oh, well, it needs to be about metabolizable protein, but the conversation for too long has been about crude protein. You know, and we, we see these responses to canola meal, um, which are effectively a metabolizable protein uplift, um, that metabolizable protein acting both as sort of you know, carbon frames within the rumen, but you know, some escape protein, no doubt as well. Um, but those responses are now very, very reliable. And we, we should be looking at that in the context of a, a diet that might be 25% crude protein with all, overall. You know, that's a ridiculous level of crude protein, but we're still responding to an MP. It indicates that our understanding, as Rodrigo mentioned, our understanding of, of what MP is created from this lush pasture is, is not particularly strong. We don't know the non-protein nitrogen content <laughs> of our pasture when we... I suspect uh, it could be quite high, yeah? I suspect it may well be here. I think you might be right. Um, we certainly uh, aim, um, Rodrigo and our, ourselves, aim to actually do some assays around the amino acid contents and total amino acid nitrogen not just crude protein and move on from that because we've got to start you know, characterising this stuff a bit better than what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, and then also remember the role that carbohydrates play, play in creating MP. That it's not, it's, just, it's not just the protein that's there and the quality of the protein there for that's there, it's also the carbohydrates to drive the bugs and create that metabolizable yeah. protein or particularly the microbial crude protein half of it, which is the good half, the, tr uh, the, the, the half, half that we're trying to set up for all of lactation. Yes, um, and another one of Lou's messages that Rodrigo touched on um, was also that when we're thinking about MP, MP brings in a range of amino acids and it's not just about the first one, two or three limiting amino acids that we might be able to provide synthetically. Hey, they are useful tools you know, used appropriately, but MP brings lower order amino acids that behave like triggers and switches within the memory gland, not just precursors to milk in the memory gland. And I don't think we've got our heads around that yet through our MP. But, and, and that mTOR discussion, I think, is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the thing that we can measure, at least. Yeah. Or, sorry, scientists can measure. Yeah. And it's just starting to show that, hey, this is that nutrition 2.0 that I think Barry Bradford, to quote another one of our friends, yeah. talks about. That nutrition 2.0, where it's not just the nutrient, it's the trigger. Yeah. It's what's it doing to the physiological system that's really exciting. And, and so the next thing on from that is, okay, here's another opportunity for you might want to talk to us about, is if we look around, okay, if we're thinking about MP, let's think about how Diamond V might help that, because we know it's got the registered claim on dry matter intake, and we know that to get MP, if we want MP or particular microbial protein, we've just got to get dry matter intake up, yeah. don't we? But then I also sort of think on there, there's the fibre digestibility stuff, which you might want to comment on. But the big one is, I remember a couple of years ago when protein was really dear, you looked at the protein yield yeah. lift from you get from Diamond V, and it was actually significant, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very cost effective. I mean, if we, if we touch on Diamond V for this, this fresh cow transition scenario, I, I don't know a tool that's more cost effective and, and more proven in this period um, than, than Diamond V is. You're absolutely right. The dry matter intake um, registered claim, uh, 
you can't go past that. You know, there's nothing more important than banging up the dry matter intake, that extra half a kilo or kilo. It's just very effective. Um, if we start talking about the fibre digestibility, if you do have compromised um, forage quality, well, it's going to help you with that. Nothing offsets bad forage. But yeah. if you do have it, you know, Diamond V on board will help you a little bit with that. Um, the MP uplift was, you know, uh, 150 grams of MP um, was one of the, the, the numbers that, that jumps out. Some of that stuff was done by Mike Allen. Some of it was done by um, good high quality researchers. It's not just sort of picking, picking sort of, you know, rubbish data. Um, it's a strong tool yeah. in that space. And, and the other interesting thing is like we're talking about XPC when we talk about that. We've also got Nutritech coming online and, and I think even go back to earlier in Rodrigo's presentation, some of the other involution stuff and those sort of yeah. things. And the anti-inflammatory component of that, LPS management, um, some of those new tools like Nutritech might even be bigger again. So I think it's a really exciting space and, and I can only applaud Rodrigo for he's dipped his toe in the water and made a massive splash. I think it's a fantastic uh, presentation he put together for us. He did good. It's good to have friends. Yeah, and, um, and he is certainly one of them. So, folks, we hope you enjoyed our quick little summary of Rodrigo's presentation. We uh, certainly enjoyed listening to it. If you missed out and you'd like to see it in full, please give Ian or I a call. We could only be too happy to get you a, uh, get you a copy of it to watch for a little while. Um, if you've got questions, please. Rod Rodders is in there, in New there in New Zealand. Steph's up in Queensland or there's Itchy or Scratchy here at the table in front of you. We would only be too happy to help. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Until next time, bye for now.